I know, I know, I know, I know. I love to set up tanks, okay? What's up everybody? Welcome back to another video on my channel. My name is Dion and you're watching Reptiliatus. In today's video, I'm gonna be showing you my two glass frog species, the H. flesh mani and the Crocronella granulosa, the granular glass frog. These animals are incredible and I can't wait to give you a closer look. After this, I need to get back to packing for Madagascar and preparing other things. The list goes on and on and on. It's a really hectic time over here at the Reptiliatus residence, I guess we'll say. And I've been really meaning to get a head start on vivariums because I'll be away for a few weeks. It would be so nice to have them growing in by the time I get back that I can take animals out of quarantine, that being the glass frogs, and move them into a beautiful planted enclosure. Well, thanks to my friends over at Exoterra who graciously sponsored this video, thank you so much. I have the perfect solution. We're going to use Substratum, which is an incredible product that we're going to talk about later. But let me tell you, it gets your plants growing fast. Well, you'll see the results in no time. It's pretty cool stuff. Let's go ahead now and take a look at the glass frogs. I'm excited to show you the two species. And then we have ourselves a paludarium to build. Oh, it's going to be a good episode. Let's get to work. So here are some of the H. flesh mani. They sleep on leaves like this. It's pretty cute. And there's actually a frog on the underside of that same leaf. <laughs> I don't want to disturb them too much. There's another one over here. I think they're taking advantage of the UVB. Actually give them UVB and an LED above. So keep that in mind, frog people. The animals can benefit from it. There's obviously a lot of fruit flies in here. I just fed them. I will show you clips of that same feeding shortly. There are seven frogs in this temporary enclosure. And they all seem to be doing really well. Okay, friends, so these are my Cochrunella granulosa, granular glass frog. You can also hear my Ufaga Pumio calling in the background, but they're just a beautiful little frog. Look at these, just a very pretty frog. Mine are still juvenile, so they're not quite done developing all the blue spotting that they get, but they are just gorgeous. I've noticed they really like sleeping on this Monstera Peru. Seems to be their favorite plant to rest on. There's always the majority of them sleeping on this plant, but they're beautiful, beautiful frogs. I have them set up in this quarantine bin like so. They have a water dish, a few different plants like this in their little pots, and they're topped with sphagnum moss just so that they don't get soil on their bodies, that sort of thing. With any animal, especially amphibians, in quarantine, it's important to do routine cleanings regularly. Here I am cleaning out the H. flesh mani enclosure, making sure to wipe down all the glass, replenish with fresh water, and ensure that all the foliage is devoid of any fecal material. This process can take quite some time, but again, super important to acclimating these animals and make sure they thrive. Same process is done with the granular glass frogs. I've moved them all into little deli cups, wipe down, clean out all the plants, and also remove the paper towel substrate, wipe everything down with a vinegar water solution, clean it all up, replace the paper towel, and get them back in their homes. It's a lot of work, but it's so worth it for these amazing animals. Okay everyone, so it's late at night. The Crocronella granulosa are out. These are the granular glass frogs. They're finally putting on some weight, but let me tell you, some of them were very, very thin when I first got them, but thankfully they're all eating well. What I love about this species is how bold they are. They do not hesitate to eat, whether it's day or night. But in any case, today's menu are some 1 4 inch crickets, and uh, yeah, let's go ahead and see if they're interested in eating.
Me, I don't always offer the frogs a water dish, but they clearly take advantage. So when they do have it, they enjoy it. Although these glass frogs are larger than the H. fleshmanis, they do get fruit flies as a stable and the 1 4th inch crickets less regularly, just as a larger meal. But yeah, check this out, they really love the fruit flies as well. Okay friends, so these are my Hyelano Betrachium fleshmani, the fleshman's or northern glass frog. They look like little gummies. I'm trying to market them as such, but they, they really do look like tiny little gummy frogs. Oh, sorry. I am fairly confident that my ratio here is something around 4.3. Pretty sure I have four males and three females, if I'm not mistaken. But these guys are really tiny. They're maybe half the size uh, that the granulated glass frogs get, so they mostly will be just eating fruit flies. Let's go ahead now and see if they want some of those Drosophila hydei. Hello. As the flies sort of make their way up, more of the frogs will discover them and eat them. So there you go. Hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of how incredible these little frogs are and how excited I am to be keeping them and hopefully breeding them someday. Now it's time to get started on the exciting paludarium build. Okay friends, the first thing we're gonna do is unwrap and unpack this beautiful Exoterra terrarium. This is a 24 inch in length, 18 inches in depth and 36 inches in height model. Perfect for a glass frog paludarium. Now, before we can get to work on our background, I need to be able to make sure the doors of the terrarium are well supported. So I'm gonna MacGyver sort of stand, if you will, to support the doors out of pillows and other things, and that should do it, ensuring that our doors won't bend so far back that they snap out of the enclosure's frame. For the installation of our cork tile background, we're going to be using the S1 clear silicone. It's an all purpose silicone and it is devoid of mold inhibitors, which you really want to make sure is the case for any type of sensitive animals such as fish and certainly amphibians. Now, I know you guys ask me all the time, Dion, where do you get this cork board? Listen, there are many different sources to buy it and the place I purchased it is definitely not the best economically because I paid so much for shipping from the West Coast to the East Coast. All I'm gonna suggest is that you look up cork insulation tile and find it in the closest location near you. Don't get destroyed by shipping rates like I did. I hope that helps. Now that the cork tile background has been measured out and cut to fit, it's ready to be installed. All we're gonna do is apply some generous lines of silicone to the back wall so that we can easily adhere the cork panels to the glass. I place some heavier books on the background to weigh it down while it cures for two days. At that point, the silicone should be cured and we can remove the books. Now comes the fun part. This here is sandblasted manzanita wood and it's perfect for these types of builds. 
Commonly used in the aquarium trade, you can create some incredibly dynamic and elegant scapes with this wood. Now, this part can be pretty time consuming, but it's time to envision the layout for the scape. I'm trying to decide where I want to position and foam in all these different branches of manzanita. I take my sweet time with this. Keep in mind that this is a time lapse, so you can only imagine how much time has elapsed in the process of me figuring out a layout I like. I'm going for as naturalistic of a look as possible. I kind of want to give it this roots growing out of a wall feel, if that makes sense. I'm going for the roots reaching down into the water portion of the paludarium look, and I'm slowly achieving that. You can see I'm using some empty small bins to prop up the wood to the angles I want them at so that they're in the right position for foaming. Now I'm using the all-purpose Great Stuff Foam to foam in those wood pieces. Although it probably would have cured in less time, after 24 hours, the foam is cured and we're safe to hold our breath and remove those plastic containers in hopes that the wood will stay in place. Looks like we're good. It's staying up. Woo! All right, let's get this all out of here and take a closer look at our scape. I'm so excited to show you. Looking at it head on, vertically the way it's meant to be oriented, I feel like I want to add one more branch to this more bare area. So I just have to decide where and how to position it and spray foam it in the same way we did before, except this time I'm going to do it right side up. I'm not going to tilt the tank back down on its back. Should be possible using the container method again. So let's get to work and spray that in. While we wait for that last little patch to cure, it's time for me to watch the FIFA World Cup while I assemble a beautiful stand that Exoterra provided me with for this terrarium. Look at this, it's gonna look awesome. Okay friends, we're making good progress. It's time to move the stand somewhere that I'm happy to continue working on this project. Let's get the tank propped up on there. It takes a sec to adjust it and align it properly and okay, all right, perfect. Okay friends, we can remove these containers now because the foam is cured and that last piece of wood is in place. I think it definitely was an important addition to the scape. Wow, look at that. It's looking pretty awesome. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is carve the foam background. So we're gonna use a Dremel tool and a shop vac to point it directly where we carve so the little pieces of styrofoam will go flying everywhere. Let's get to work now and carve this beautiful masterpiece. I hope you can forgive me if it's a weird thing to say, but doing this makes me feel like some sort of dental hygienist. Just going along like that, carving with a Dremel, makes me feel like I'm cleaning teeth or something. And it doesn't help that I have the shop vac sucking up the mess just like you would with the water in someone's mouth. Okay, with our background carved, it's time to proceed with applying the silicone and coconut husk all over this. The coconut husk fiber will stick to the silicone and coat the foam. It goes without saying, you definitely want to wear gloves doing this and create a well-ventilated space because the silicone gives off some nasty fumes. Basically, just rub the silicone generously into all parts of the foam and press in the cocoa husk firmly. After giving the background a few days to dry, it's time to suck up any additional substrate that isn't actually stuck to the foam. This will also allow us to look for any spots that need touching up in case we missed adding the silicone and cocoa fiber to any particular area. And then from there, as long as everything looks good, we're ready to move on to the next step. 
Using this blade, I'm going to just remove all the smeared silicone that I accidentally rubbed on the glass while doing the coconut husk on the foam background. This will just ensure that the side walls are clear and clean. I also use the Dremel again to remove any silicone that was left on the manzanita wood, as well as remove any sharp points on any of the pieces of wood that I was concerned might harm the frogs that will eventually live in this enclosure. Okay friends, we're going to be building a false rock wall, but part of that is holding it together with good old fashioned terrarium putty. Using a odorless clay based kitty litter, as well as a bit of substrate to give it a more natural tone, we're going to mix this blend together with a small amount of water until we get a truly Play-Doh like consistency. You really have to mash this up with the right amount of water for quite some time, it's quite the hand workout, until you don't notice the grains. You really want it to all be that one consistency. Now using these false rock aquarium barriers I still have from years ago, we're going to hold this in place and I'm making sure to leave small spaces for water to flow freely under it so that the substrate will get water as needed. But we're just going to use the terrarium putty to anchor it all together. Imagine again that you're laying bricks and you just need to build this wall up using the terrarium putty. As long as it stays in contact with water and moisture, it won't dry out and crack. That's an important aspect using this. If it's just dry, eventually it will crack and become brittle. But if it's in contact with water, as seen in Project Mini Dragons when we made the retaining wall there, it works perfectly. And what's also kind of cool is that plants can grow into that. Now we're going to add a sort of sponge filter retaining wall, if you will, to the back side of our rock wall so that when we add our substrate in a second, it won't cross over and mix up or come through the spots that we allowed for water to pass through, if that makes sense. So this will be a sort of protection retaining wall and it's going to do a great job for that. Now it's time for us to add our Exoterra Substratum, one of my favorite products on the market. This bioactive volcanic substrate is loaded with nitrifying bacteria as well as nutrients that are incredibly beneficial for your plants. And as if that wasn't cool enough, each individual substrate particle is porous, allowing for plenty of airflow around plant roots, which means that you can actually use substratum as a sole substrate to grow your plants. Using more strips of the sponge filter, I'm just reinforcing the barrier between the sponge wall and our rock wall to ensure that none of the substratum falls between the two. Now that that's secure, I can add more substrate to top it off to the level we want it before we start planting. For the water portion of the enclosure, I'm adding silica sand as a substrate. I'm also taking one last piece of manzanita branch that I want to have arc into the water feature as a sort of a continuation of a root, if you will, going into the water. I think it's going to accent things really nice and create a dynamic layout. Now I'm going to go ahead and add water to the enclosure. I've laid down a plastic sheet so that we can carefully pour water over it and not stir up all the sand and make a big mess of everything. Okay friends, it's my favorite part of the build. Time to plant the enclosure. As you can see here, I'm choosing aeroid plants because it's my hope that they'll grow up some of the wood and the background and provide plenty of foliage for the glass frogs to sleep on and climb over. Glass frogs love to perch on broad and large leaves and I find them climbing all over vines most of the night so having Monstera adansonii planted in this paludarium would be an excellent candidate in serving this purpose. The next steroid we're going to add to the enclosure is a beautiful Philodendron Melanochrysium. This plant will grow very large foliage and anchor itself on the cork background, 
So I'm going to dedicate a large space up the middle of the tank, keeping that area clear, foreshadowing that this plant will eventually grow all the way up to the top with beautiful large velvety leaves. Next we're adding a beautiful long vine piece of Raphidophora decursiva, a plant I hope will grow all the way up the background and again provide plenty of large foliage for the glass frogs to feel secure in their home. I'm going to add a Neoregelia fireball to the corner of the enclosure. It's just a nice pup. I'm adding some sphagnum moss around the root base to keep it moistened so it'll grow roots faster and get the hydration it needs. And we're simply going to stick it into the foam because they anchor super well with that spike. Next, I'm going to cover the whole land area substratum substrate with loose strands of sphagnum moss. I decided to place some Solarolia solarolii over top of that side of the moss. This is commonly known as baby tears and loves a shaded, moistened or even wet environment. Hopefully it does well. Using some wet sphagnum moss and a little bit of planting wire, I was able to create bundles around these cuttings so that I can plant them in higher areas in the tank and not worry about them being planted in substrate. My hope is that over time they'll grow aerial roots and anchor themselves to the surface I tie them to. Here I'm adding some Pilea numularifolia to the edges of the rock wall in hopes that it'll kind of grow and drape down into the water area. Pilea in this regard really loves a moist or wet environment so I think it'll do well in this spot. Now I'm going to continue to cover all the substrate with sphagnum moss. Again this just prevents the frogs from accidentally coming into contact with small particles of the substratum substrate which can be stressful for the animals if it sticks to them and doesn't come off easily. Here I'm adding another beautifully colored bromeliad pup to the wood. I'm going to anchor it on here and tie it on with some moss and plant wire again. And now we're going to dress the moss with plenty of leaf litter. Although this may seem surprising to some of you, I'm intentionally adding leaf litter to the water portion of the paludarium so that it will saturate with water, sink to the bottom and add tannins. For the next few weeks while the plants acclimate, I'm saran wrapping the top of the enclosure off to retain additional humidity just to make that transitioning and acclimating process a bit easier. We'll cover the full top and stick the screen back on afterwards. Now it's time to get our lighting set up. This is the compact top and this particular model for our size terrarium houses three bulbs. I'll be using three forest canopy 8 watt LED bulbs. With the humidity secured better now that we've added the saran wrap over the top of the tank, I want to make a bit of a moss spread. I took some live sphagnum moss and some live java and cut it up fine in some dried wet sphagnum moss and we're just going to spread it and stick it to different parts of the enclosure in hopes that it might eventually grow and spread. I've had this work pretty successfully in other builds so hopefully it'll do the same thing here. Now I gave the enclosure a nice little spray down with some reverse osmosis water. I'm so excited to watch this incredible paludarium grow in, it's going to be amazing. I'm really happy with how this paludarium turned out. I can't wait to show you guys an update in a few months once the plants have established themselves, rooted better and started growing in here. I'm going to probably add a submersible filter to the water feature before I add any inhabitants, but for now the focus is just going to be on getting this tank to grow in nicely and have the plants thrive for the next few weeks or even months. Awesome! For today's question of the day, I'd like to ask you all, which of the two species do you think we should move into the new paludarium I just set up? Should we move the Croconella granulosa 
or should we move the H-Flush Monies into the Paludarium? Either way, they're both gonna get a nice new enclosure, but this will be the first one that some of the animals move into, so you decide. Cochranella granulosa are a little bit bigger, maxing out at closer to two inches, one and a half if you will, but there are more of the H-Flush Mani, so perhaps they're a better option. Let me know in the comment section down below. As always, I'll give you a comment a heart, and we can engage in a little bit of a conversation. Thanks. Well, everybody, there you have it. I sincerely hope you enjoyed watching today's video. It's always a blast getting to set up new enclosures for amazing animals and showing you the process. I want to take a moment again to sincerely thank Exoterra for sponsoring this video. It's just really well appreciated and I'm sure the animals are gonna love that enclosure once it's had a few months to grow in. I can't wait to give you guys an update on that. I think it's gonna look great. I also can't wait for all those aeroids to kind of take over with the good lighting and nutrients. It's gonna look so awesome. The before and after, Ooh, can't wait to show you that. With that all being said, if you enjoyed today's video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. If you have any further questions, feel free to comment down below. Don't forget to answer today's question of the day. If you want to see a terrarium build playlist for all my other build videos, check out the playlist up above. Otherwise, I can't wait to see you all next week for an upcoming video. Have a wonderful weekend. Take care, everyone.